Shen Yu drifted between the realms of dreams and wakefulness. He finally opened his beautiful eyes, only to be surprised that the person holding him was not the commander. He hastily pushed the emperor away, making Shen Yu fall on the cold ground of the cave they were taking shelter in. Shen Yu tried to make sense of what happened. He recalls what brought him to this predicament. The princess consort pushed him off the cliff before he lost consciousness. What is the emperor doing here with him? He wonders if the emperor saved him. Why is the emperor here, but the commander is not? His heart sank at the thought that his lord abandoned him. The emperor can't be helped but be embarrassed by his own lack of self-restraint. Before Shen Yu woke up, he was on the verge of kissing him. He can't believe that this poor mute would invoke such a want from him. The commander observed Shen Yu, unable to take his eyes off him. He noticed that Shen Yu pulled back his hair with his dainty hand. In spite of Shen Yu's perfect physique, there's something odd about his pointer finger. In the book, it states that Shen Yu has an extra knuckle on the pointer finger. The emperor continued to look at Shen Yu with an unfathomable expression on his face. Emperor Ya approached the captivating mute and urged him to not be afraid. He explained that Shen Yu had a fever, and he simply wanted to know how Shen Yu was feeling. He held Shen Yu's dainty hands in his, inspecting each delicate finger. He asked Shen Yu if his hands were hurt by the commander. Shen Yu promptly pulled his hands away from the emperor's grasp. He tried to convey with hand gestures that he was all right and that the emperor should not get closer. The Emperor Ya understood Shen Yu's request and placated him. In order to keep warm, Emperor Ya kept his distance from Shen Yu and tended to the fire. He further commented that Shen Yu's delicate hands were pitiful, alluding that they may have been damaged by Jun Su Ang Xiao. Shen Yu does not care about the state of his hand. It does not matter if his hands were injured or disabled. Perfection means nothing if the commander no longer wants Shen Yu. The Emperor quietly watched Shen Yu. There can be no mistake. He recognized that knuckle for what it was. It is no wonder that Jun Su Ang Xiao was very determined to hide Shen Yu from him. What's with the knuckle? While they allowed for the night to pass, the fire kept them warm. When it was safe to leave the safety of the cold cave, Emperor Ya tried his best to get closer to Shen Yu. He kindly told Shen Yu to not move too much. Shen Yu's frail health will hinder his safe passage through the mountain in these chilly conditions. Emperor Ya suggested that he carry Shen Yu out of the cave so that they could move faster and meet up with Jun Su Ang Xiao. He removed his coat and draped it over Shen Yu's frail shoulders. At least he's being a gentleman. Shen Yu is unable to contain a cough and allows the emperor to cover him with his coat. He did not protest. His thoughts were solely occupied by the commander and the lawman to reunite with him soon. Two figures walk the snowy ground. Their movements are careful and sluggish. A soldier from the hunting party spotted them. He called for the others to alert them of the two figures that resemble the emperor and concubine Yin. Jun Su Ang Xiao quickly made his way to the two weary figures. He desperately called for his concubine, hoping that it was indeed him. Shen Yu was very tired, but he did not protest when the emperor placed a firm hand on his shoulder. A voice calling his name startled him. It is a sound that he will recognize anywhere. The lone figure of the lord with his hair fluttering in the harsh wind made Shen Yu's heart flutter. It can only be the commander. He is relieved by the fact that the commander's expression differs from the one in his dream. He slapped the hand holding him back and quickly ran towards Jun Su Ang Xiao. His heart swells knowing that he was not abandoned. The Lord has been looking at him. Jun Su Ang Xiao is relieved that Shen Yu is alive. This heartfelt reunion was interrupted by Shen Yu's clumsiness. The dainty concubine Yin stumbled face down on the snow. You, you clumsy fool. Jun Su Ang Xiao carefully approached Shen Yu to help him up. The emperor addressed the commander and expressed his joy at being found. He explained that he found Shen Yu, who was unconscious, the night before. As he is alone and tired, he opts to take Shen Yu to a nearby cave, where they spend the night in each other's embrace to keep themselves farm. Otherwise, they would have frozen to death. Do you really need to go into detail? He's trying to make it sound like they did more than sleep. The commander stilled his movements while his thoughts were flooded by Shen Yu and the emperor, sharing intimate moments. How could those two become so intimate in just one night? He even observed that Shen Yu had been wearing the emperor's coat. Jealousy crawled into his heart as he spitefully thought about how interesting it is that the two hug each other. He clenched his fist in anger. He respectfully bowed to the emperor and expressed his relief that the emperor was safe. Emperor Ya dismissed Jun Su An Shou's concerns, saying that he was all right. The concubine Yin, on the other hand, was unconscious for most of the night and suffered a fever. Shen Yu had been coughing so hard at this point that he did not hear the conversation. Emperor Ya emphasized once more that he took care of Shen Yu. 
and urged Jun Suan Xiao to escort him promptly. As they are sworn brothers, and Jun Suan Xiao is the pillar of the Daijing Empire, the emperor expressed that Jun Suan Xiao need not thank him for taking care of his family. The hidden message is not lost to Jun Suan Xiao, as he seethed. Shen Yu, who still has not recovered from his fever, is happy that he is finally in the presence of the Lord. He tentatively reached out his hand toward Jun Suan Xiao's, longing to sense the Lord's joy at his return. Shen Yu's joy was short lived. The Lord slapped his hand away, which caused Shen Yu to stagger and fall to the cold ground. Why are you so mean? And why do you always take it out on Shen Yu? Jun Su An Xiao looked down at him mockingly, while he asked Shen Yu what it felt like to be embraced by the Emperor. Dread settled on the pit of Shen Yu's stomach as he tried to deny Jun Su An Xiao's allegations, but his mute constitution did not allow him to explain that nothing happened between them. He'd only shake his head in denial, but just like before, the commander does not believe him. Noticing that Jun Su An Xiao had not yet taken Shen Yu to rest, the Emperor approached them. He asked, concernedly, why Jun Suan Xiao had still not taken action when Yu was obviously still feverish. The Emperor's concern annoyed Jun Suan Xiao further. With a flutter of his robe, the commander hugged Shen Yu who looked so weak that a wind would blow him away. Shen Yu stared up at the commander still shaking his head in denial. In the grip of a feverish mind, he clung to the determination to make himself heard, yearning for the Lord to believe his innocence. In this desperation, he lost consciousness in the arms he yearns the most. Jun Su An Xiao let out a sigh as he calmed himself. He touched Shen Yu's face, trying to soothe the unconscious Shen Yu. The emperor rushed to the couple asking what happened to Shen Yu. The commander did not respond right away, seemingly in deep thought. He lifted Shen Yu up and thanked the emperor for saving his concubine. He then proceeded to tell the emperor not to bother about Shen Yu further and took his leave with Shen Yu in his arms. The Emperor's attendants fussed over him as they added more layers of cloak to his person. Emperor Yao obliged them as he watched Jun Su An Xiao take Shen Yu back to the carriage. He knew that the Emperor valued Shen Yu so much. The Emperor's countenance takes on a scheming expression reminiscent of his sister's. Their hunting party quickly returned to the capital after the attack. The commander entrusted Shen Yu's care to the Imperial doctor, Bai and Shizi. The commander paid him no attention and never visited Shen Yu. Beyond Shisi couldn't believe that the commander took Shen Yu to the winter hunting when he knew that Shen Yu should be protected and cared for. He complains out loud that it would be great if the commander set up a place for him in the mansion so he can watch over the beautiful concubine. If that were the case, he would stay at Jun Su An Xiao's mansion forever. He finally noticed that Shen Yu was awfully quiet and seemed to be distracted. He wouldn't even react to Beyond Shisi's mindless chatter. While grinding some herbs, Beyond Shisi asked him if he can't talk. The imperial doctor slapped himself when he realized that he was talking to a mute. He called Shen Yu dumb and commented on how boring he was. From behind beyond Shi Si, someone clad in gold commented that if he were bored, why not go back to the capital? Beyond Shi Si was startled by the unexpected visitor. He bowed his head in respect to the emperor. The emperor expressed his displeasure at beyond Shi Si who has been avoiding him since he arrived in the North City. He prevented Bian Shisi's hasty retreat and handed him a piece of paper. It appears that someone asked the emperor to pass along a note. Bian Shisi only took a moment to look at the letter and promptly discarded it in the open fire. The emperor was surprised that he wouldn't even read its contents. The person who made the request to pass the letter to Bian Shisi wanted him to know that he was dearly missed and that he must return to the capital if he was no longer angry. Bian Shisi already has an idea of what the letter would say. He is dismayed that the person won't even come in person. He tells the emperor that he won't be easily swayed and that even a set in chair carried by eight people won't convince him to come back to the capital. He bowed to the emperor and promptly excused himself, making an excuse that he had other patients to see. The emperor commented that the imperial doctor was talkative and told Shen Yu that if he found Beyond Shi Si annoying, the emperor would find someone else to take care of Shen Yu. Shen Yu's cold demeanor did not change. He pointedly ignored the emperor. The emperor reached out to Shen Yu, which made Shen Yu draw back. Emperor Ya commented that it's been a while since Shen Yu returned home and asked if he was feeling better. Shen Yu turned his back to the emperor, clearly annoyed at his presence. The emperor was not deterred by Shen Yu's attitude and asked if Shen Yu still wanted to hide from him. He noticed that Shen Yu's complexion had improved compared to the time they spent together in the cave. The emperor dropped the concerned look and smirked as he commented that Jun Su An Xiao was so cruel that he wouldn't even visit Shen Yu. He knows that this will draw a reaction from Shen Yu. 
Noticing that he finally caught Shen Yu's attention, he carried on by belittling Jun Su on Shell for not cherishing his concubine. He compared himself to the commander as he, the emperor, paid Shen Yu a visit. Shen Yu angrily sat up straight to glare at the emperor. His expression shows his obvious anger at hearing bad words being said about the emperor. Although indignant at hearing the commander being criticized, Shen Yu remembered how the commander treated him and tried to deny that the commander was not being cruel to him. As he can't explain himself, Shen Yu decides to stare angrily at the emperor. The emperor understood what Shen Yu was mad about and clarified if Shen Yu was angry at what he said. The emperor took the hind that his presence is not wanted and took his leave. He bid Shen Yu goodbye and wish him a good rest. On the way out of Xiao Wai Yard, the emperor bumped into Jun Su An Xiao. The emperor told Jun Su An Xiao that Shen Yu had taken his medicine and that Shen Yu's condition had gotten better. He even told Jun Xian Xiao that he should go ahead and visit Shen Yu. Shen Yu noticed that the emperor acted as if he were Shen Yu's husband and Jun Su An Xiao was the visitor. He bowed respectfully to the emperor and sarcastically thanked the emperor for taking good care of Shen Yu. The emperor acted surprised by his tone. He pointed out that he is aware of how Jun Su An Xiao would easily discard beautiful men's and women's clothes, especially when they have been taken by others. He finds it surprising that Jun Su An Xiao would even ask him to appoint Shen Yu as Jun Su An Xiao's life partner. Jun Su An Xiao countered that he has no habit of taking hand-me-downs, these two are treating Shen Yu like an object. Shen Yu is not a piece of clothing, he's a person with feelings. The emperor countered that gentlemen do not take what belongs to others. The word but hangs in the air, which annoyed Jun Su An Xiao. The emperor is implying that he coveted Shen Yu, and that something more may have happened between them. Jun Su An Xiao changed the topic and told the emperor that he had come to see him about something else. He asked the emperor to take Dai Ro with him when the emperor returned to the capital. The emperor asked him if Jun Su An Xiao ever had feelings for Princess Consort after years of marriage. The commander frowned and frankly told the emperor that he ever harbored feelings for her. They had long disappeared. The emperor was taken aback by Jun Su An Xiao's next words. The commander asked the emperor if he got what he wanted. Feigning ignorance, the emperor asked Jun Su An Xiao what he meant. As the commander of the north, Jun Su An Xiao has been battling with the Huns all his life. His discerning eye can differentiate the Huns from the Hun people. The commander stepped forward so that he was shoulder to shoulder with Emperor Ya. Close to the Emperor's ears, he revealed that he knew what the Emperor did. The Emperor staged the attack using hundreds of guards only to have a night with Shen Yu. He went as far as to ask if the Emperor was satisfied. The Emperor realized that he could use this misunderstanding to his advantage and laughed mockingly at Jun Su An Xiao, falsely admitting that he was indeed satisfied as Shen Yu was an enchanting beauty. With resentment hanging in the air, the two parted ways. Jun Su An Xiao can't help but clench his hand in anger. His thoughts were clouded with jealousy. In his head, he cursed at Shen Yu. Now that Shen Yu has been tarnished, he feels so much anger and decides that Shen Yu will leave out his life in Xiao Wai Yard, alone and abandoned until the day he dies. Jun Su An Xiao went to visit Shen Yu's room while his concubine slept. His sleep is troubled. Jun Su An Xiao reasoned with himself that he only came to see if Shen Yu was still alive. While he believes that Shen Yu and the Emperor had an affair, he can't help but be irritable. He does not understand why he is feeling this way. Shen Yu made a noise while still in the land of dreams. He must be having a nightmare as he cried and trembled in his sleep. He turns over and reaches out, without hesitation. Jun Su An Xiao grabbed hold of his hand. Shen Yu's fingers tightened around his hand. He noticed that Shen Yu was sleeping with the first male clothes he gave him. Shen Yu must have been using it as a comfort blanket. Jun Su An Xiao reached out to try to tub the robes from Shen Yu's grasp, but the sleeping Shen Yu only held on to the robes tighter. As he pulled on the robe, he noticed that Shen Yu was crying. The commander's heart ached at seeing Shen Yu's tears and decided to leave the robe where it was. He lifted Shen Yu's hand and drew it closer to his cheek. He contemplated on the fact that he found Shen Yu first, but he was not able to finish the thought as Shen Yu's hand clenched around his. Shen Yu unconsciously drew nearer to Jun Su Wang Xiao, and his face finally relaxed. Jun Su Wang Xiao thought that Shen Yu must be at ease in his presence. He signed and leaned down to give Shen Yu a kiss. He stayed at Shen Yu's bedside, just watching him sleep. In the following days, the princess consort requested to meet the commander so that she could admit to her mistakes and beg for forgiveness. Even when she prostrated to the ground and admitted to her crimes, the commander refused to grant her wish. The emperor scolded her furiously.
It may be because it is embarrassing for the emperor's sister to beg for whatever reason. However, the commander of the north did not bring up the matter of divorce on the day the emperor was due to return to the capital, so the princess consort stayed in the commander's mansion. Before stepping into his palanquin, Emperor Ye lectured Dai Ru to not be so stubborn. As she is not at the royal palace, the emperor cannot protect her at all times. Dai Ru tearfully said her farewells, but she reasoned that if only the commander cared more about her. The emperor conspirationally told her to do as she was told. He told her to keep what the emperor gave her as it would be useful in the future, to which she obediently agreed. Now, what are these two scheming? Fireworks blasted to the sky in colorful lights. The festive atmosphere surrounds the mansion, except for one place, the Shao Wa Yard. Shen Yu sits alone in his room. He notes that although he is feeling better, the commander has yet to visit him. Being alone is not how Shen Yu wants to spend New Year's Eve. He must see the commander. He decided to take matters into his own hands and go to meet the commander. He rummaged through his things looking for the three dragon jade pendant that the commander gave him. Realizing that the pendant was not where it was supposed to be, Shen Yu panicked. Where is it? It should be in the box. Shen Yu reels with panic as he finally accepts that the pendant is missing. Shen Yu searched the whole Shaowa yard for the jade pendant. It is not in the box, not in the chests, not under his bed. He clearly remembers putting it in its suitcase when he went to the winter hunting in a pocket near the chest. After his tragic fall off the cliff, he was ill and unable to think coherently. He did not realize that the jade pendant had been missing. He slumped on the floor as he wiped his tears. The jade pendant is a precious gift from the commander. Where could it be? He wonders if he lost it when he fell off the cliff. Shen Yu intends to take the jade pendant with him when he sees the commander, hoping to invoke the commander's feelings for him. Perhaps, the commander will remember how he felt for Shen Yu and allow him a chance to explain. As it is New Year's Eve, Shen Yu wants to spend it with the commander. His mind made up. Shen Yu decided to go to the commander without the jade pendant. He shall look for it when he comes back. He must see the commander and clear the misunderstanding. The commander of the north sat in his study, poring over some missives. He tries to focus, but his mind strays back to Shen Yu. He remembers the time he spent watching Shen Yu sleep and thinks to himself that he must have been possessed that day. He mentally beats himself up for not exercising control. He should have refrained from visiting Shen Yu, but he can't help himself. An attendant announced that concubine Yin had come to see him. Jun Su Anxiao did not expect a visit from Shen Yu but allowed him entry to his study. Shen Yu was delighted as he walked cautiously inside Jun Su Anxiao's study. He did not expect that the commander would grant his request to see him. This must be a good sign. Without looking up from his work, Jun Su Anxiao asked Shen Yu what he came here for when he was not summoned. Shen Yu gesticulated with sign language to tell the commander that he had come to spend New Year's Eve with him. He tried to explain that nothing happened between him and the emperor when he fell off the cliff. Noticing that the commander is not even paying attention, Shen Yu thought that he may not be expressing himself clearly through sign language. He realized that it may be better to write down what he wanted to say. He approached the commander's desk and tried to use his writing implements to explain what happened, but his attempts were halted by Jun Su Anxiao. Irritably, Jun Su Anxiao told him that he did not give him permission to use his things. Why are you being stingy? It's just pen and paper. Shen Yu panicked at his tone and backed away slowly. Without thinking, the commander asked Shen Yu if he remembered his place. This made Shen Yu realize that his position had not changed. His sole purpose is to serve the commander. Jun Su Anxiao must have allowed him entry to the study so that he could serve his master. Realizing that he is but a slave, he nervously undressed. You poor thing. Seeing Shen Yu offering himself up to him only irritated Jun Su Anxiao more. His jealous thoughts bring up the image of Emperor Ye's admission that he enjoyed spending the night with Shen Yu. Clicking his tongue, he asked Shen Yu if he was well enough to serve him and got up to menacingly tower over Shen Yu. Shen Yu fearfully looked up at him. His breath was forcefully knocked out of him as he was shoved onto the desk. Shen Yu fearfully lies face down on the desk while the commander looms over him. The stain of ink on his face. The commander mocks Shen Yu for being dirty. He tells Shen Yu that the black ink suits him. He believes that Shen Yu must be treasuring the time he spends with the emperor. He even threatened to ruin Shen Yu's beautiful face so that no other man would look at him. Shen Yu tried to shake his head in denial. The commander mistook Shen Yu's actions as his way of asking for forgiveness. He sits down in front of Shen Yu's alluring form, silently inviting him to serve him. Shen Yu understands what the commander wants. He sat on the commander's lap as he initiated a kiss. Shen Yu proceeded to serve the commander as expected of a slave. 
The night wore on. The commander continued to pore over his missives while Shen Yu slept, his body littered with bruises. Jun Su Anxiao proceeded to write his approval on a report. One of his subordinates found a man to serve him. He dropped the report on his desk as casually as he discarded Shen Yu's feelings. In the Imperial Palace, Emperor Ya orders to weaken the commander's military power and retract his commander's seal. One of the advisors protested that the emperor could not do as he pleased. Another reason that their military might be weakened by doing so, leaving Da Jing defenseless against their enemies. Another reason that it may lead to rebellion as the commander will not simply take the imperial decree lying down. Resolute in his decision, the emperor explained that he had no other choice. The commander committed the crime of concealing a person from Yunmon. Who is the emperor referring to? The commander spends his time in his study. A report informs him that the emperor called for a secret meeting in the imperial palace with the intention of weakening his military power and taking back his commander's seal. It explains that the emperor found proof of him hiding a descendant of Young Meng in his home. He reads through the report, seemingly unafraid, nor does he look surprised. Another person scooted behind him, asking him to rest as he must have been tired. The person stooped intimately close to Jun Suang Xiao, reaching towards his clothes, promising to help him relax. Who is this person? Jun Su Anxiao stopped the hand from its intimate pursuit and pushed away the person to whom the hand belonged, to the bafflement of the effeminate man. Jun Su Anxiao moved closer to the fire and threw the paper containing the report to the flames. As the report slowly caught fire, Jun Su Anxiao watched it burn, a plan forming in his head. In spite of Shen Yu's efforts, he was not able to regain the emperor's trust. He returned to Xiao Hua Yard littered with bruises, his recent encounter with the commander made him sick again for several days. When he finally felt better, Shen Yu decided to visit the commander once again. However, Song Qing stood in his way. The loyal guard blocks the door whenever Shen Yu tries to leave. This is the third time that Song Qing hindered him from seeing the commander. Song Qing wonders why Shen Yu insists on seeing the commander. He asks himself if Shen Yu has not suspected anything. He tells Shen Yu that the commander has left. Shen Yu wonders if the commander is simply busy or he just doesn't want to see him. He asks Song Qing when will the commander return, and finally catching on he asks if he is being lied to. Song Qing cannot take at him as lies through his teeth. Song Qing told him that he was not lying and that the commander asked Shen Yu to transcribe all the books they covered in their lessons as punishment. He further told Shen Yu that he couldn't see the commander until he finished transcribing all the books. Happy that there is a chance to see the commander, Shen Yu looked at him with renewed hope. He quickly started to work on the books. I feel so bad for Shen Yu. Song Xing is treating him like a kid that he can deceive. Just tell him that the commander is being a complete moron. Song Xing only used books to keep Shen Yu occupied. There are hundreds of books that the Lord himself wrote after his battles. It contains the Lord's strategies and conclusions for each battle he fought. The staggering number should be enough to keep Shen Yu busy. Song Xing miscalculated Shen Yu's eagerness. Shen Yu diligently transcribes the books, hoping that you will receive praise from the commander like he used to do. He pored over the books, even doing research on words, theories, and strategies that he did not understand. He even memorized all the texts in case the commander decided to quiz him. He worked hard, while Song Qing guiltily watched him. A noise from outside Xiao Hua Yard alerted Song Qing. Shen Yu. He checked the noise outside only to see the servants lighting the lanterns. Shen Yu sat hunched over the desk, pushing himself to finish quickly. If only he could transcribe the books quicker and memorize their contents, then he would be able to see the commander again. He will finally be forgiven, and they can go back to how they used to be. My heart bleeds for Shen Yu. Song Qing might be doing this to protect Shen Yu from the truth, but he is doing it the wrong way. Just tell him the truth. Shen Yu finally finished transcribing all the books. He patiently waits outside of the yard. His heart swells at the thought that the commander will come to see him now that he has done what he was told to do. He asks Song Qing to take him to the Lord, so he can show off his hard work. Song Qing underestimated Shen Yu's diligence as it only took him two days to transcribe all the books. Song Qing told Shen Yu that the Lord was busy with military affairs and should not be disturbed. He tells Shen Yu that if the commander finds time off his busy schedule, he will come to visit Shen Yu. Dejectedly, Shen Yu dropped the basket of parchments to the food and slumped on the floor. That feeling you have when you studied hard for a quiz, only for the professor to not show up. Shen Yu remembers his childhood as he hugs his knees. Locked up in their little hut, he would wait for his mother to bring him food every day. Things did not seem to change for Shen Yu, as now he just waits for the commander to come see him. A voice calls from behind him asking if he is the concubine Yin. 
This is when Shen Yu realized that the more you plead for something, the lower its value becomes. A beautiful man dressed in purple robes stood in front of Shen Yu's slumped form. The man asks if he is waiting for the Lord. He then proceeds to look at Shen Yu pityingly as he tells him that the commander is being rude for not telling his previous lover that he is now with someone else and that someone else is him. The man dressed in women's robes is planked by maidservants. The tension was thick as Shen Yu took in what the man said. Song Xing spoke up in Shen Yu's defense and told the man that he should leave and that he was not welcome at Xiao Wai Yard. Shen Yu wondered who this man was. He used hand gestures to ask Song Qing if the man's claims were true. The man leaned down addressing Shen Yu like one would a child. He introduced himself as Han Li Yan, the most famous actor in the Qin Hu Ai Tower. The man smiled openly at Shen Yu and told him that it was the princess consort who invited him to steal the commander's attention from Shen Yu. So, he's here to announce that he is the new villain? At least, he is honest. He politely tells Shen Yu that they will be seeing a lot of each other and should treat each other nicely. Song Qing quickly grabbed the man by the arm and rudely asked him to leave. A threat hangs in the air as he warns the man of the consequences. Hong Li Yan did not bat an eye at his rudeness and Wanli flirted with the surprised Song Qing. Hong Li Yan tells Shen Yu that he initially thought that he could not win the Lord's affection against a beauty like Shen Yu. Upon realizing that Shen Yu was not treated well, judging by the state of Xiao Wai Yard and Shen Yu's clothes, his chances are higher. If the commander loved his concubine, he would have treated him better. He noticed the rolled parchment in Shen Yu's basket. Hong Li Yan concluded that Shen Yu probably relieves his boredom by transcribing books because he is lonely. Annoying at the unwanted guest, Shen Yu stood up carrying his books with him, while conveying with his eyes that what he does is not Han Li Yan's business. Han Li Yan continued to annoy Shen Yu by pointing out that Shen Yu was leaving because of what Han Li Yan told him. He asked Shen Yu what he aims to achieve by staying at this bleak place when the Lord has been indifferent to him for so long. With all the sincerity he could muster, Shen Yu turned to him and signed that all he wanted was the Lord's heart. Song Qing translated Shen Yu's gesture to Han Li Yan. Shen Yu's answer surprised the actor. Hong Li Yan took pity on Shen Yu, but he knows that Shen Yu's desire is fooling and ridiculous. He asked Shen Yu if he was a fool. All of the Lord's concubines loved him, yet the Lord paid them no mind when they died. Shen Yu is just a bumpkin in a long line of lovers and is not special. He harshly tells Shen Yu that it is foolish for him to think that he can win the Lord's heart. He's being mean, but sometimes we need that friend to tell us that we are being delusional. Shen Yu thinks back to how the Lord treated him. He comforts himself with the thought that the commander treated him differently from the way he treated the other concubines. He holds on to the commander's words that he loved him. If he does not care a smidge for Shen Yu, he would not add Shen Yu's name to the family's pedigree. Hong Li Yan is irritated that Shen Yu has no reaction to his harsh words. He calls Shen Yu a stubborn mute and thinks it is better to not mind him if he does not listen to his kind advice. He then proceeded to order the servants to take the furniture he liked from Xiao Hua Yard. He does this as compensation for being angered. Song Qing tried to stop the servants from taking Shen Yu's things and told Han Li Yan that Xiao Wai Yard belonged to the side concubine and that he should not be bullied. Han Li Yan mockingly laughed as he told them that he was doing this with the Lord's permission. He bid them farewell, mockingly laughing his head off. Song Qing was irritated by the visit and promised Shen Yu to quickly drive Han Li Yan away if he came back. He assures Shen Yu that the commander's affection for the man is not permanent. The commander is discussing strategies with his trusted soldiers. A noise from outside alerted the commander of someone's presence and called for the person outside to show himself. It is Shen Yu. The soldiers excuse themselves. The side concubine might have an urgent matter to discuss with the Lord. The commander orders the soldiers to leave and reminds Shen Yu that he does not have permission to walk around the mansion. Shen Yu did not mind being looked down upon. The visit from Hong Li Yan made him realize something. Song Qing was surprised by Shen Yu's movements and tried to stop him. Shen Yu thought that the commander must not be aware of how Shen Yu felt. He thinks that if he gives the commander the dice that he meticulously carved the commander's name on, the commander will know how he feels about him. He explains that while he is aware that he is not allowed to wander the mansion, he still goes ahead to see the commander to give him a gift. The commander does not appreciate it, as he carelessly bestows gifts to others. As everything Shen Yu owns is his, what could the concubine have to gift him with? Shen Yu placed the dice on the commander's hand and explained the meaning behind the gift. Shen Yu's mother told him that it is a tradition in their hometown to engrave their lover's name on a red bean, insert it into a dice, and hand it over to their loved one as a gift. He further explained that it took him a while to finish and has been waiting for the opportunity to give it to the Lord. 
He tells the Lord that it is Jun Su Angxiao's name on the dice, showing Shen Yu's love for him. Jun Su Angxiao studied the dice and noticed his name on the bean. Shen Yu waited in anticipation for his reaction. The Lord played with the dice in his fingers and smiled. Shen Yu's heart soared with hope. The commander is smiling. It had been so long since he saw the commander smile. He is elated at the thought that the commander finally understands his feelings. Will the commander finally forgive Shen Yu? The commander raised the dice as he studied it from all angles. Shen Yu patiently waited and slowly approached the commander. Before he can reach out to Jun Su Ang Xiao, the commander mocked Shen Yu for giving him something useless. Shen Yu was taken aback. He was so sure that the commander would understand how valuable the dice were to Shen Yu. He wonders if the commander is simply ignorant or if there is any other way to show him how much he loves him. Jun Su Ang Xiao carelessly handled the dice. He abruptly walked towards an open window to the surprise of passing servants. He noticed that one of them was carrying a wooden pass, jingling from their belt. He proceeded to lift the dice with two fingers, telling Shen Yu that he did not appreciate a childish gift. With a sinking feeling, Shen Yu watched as the commander heartlessly threw the dice into the snow-covered yard. Shen Yu quickly rushed outside. In his haste, he slipped and fell face down to the ground. Shen Yu did not mind the pain. It was nothing compared to what he felt in his heart. He crawled on the snow-covered ground, hoping to find the dice. His bleeding hands tainted the white snow red. Jun Su An Xiao watched from the window with worry but decided to ignore Shen Yu. He turned his back on his side concubine, leaving him with a broken heart. Shen Yu continued to look for the dice through the night. A spark of hope ignited in his heart when he spotted something red, only to be disappointed when he found a drop of blood in the white snow. Finally, he found the dice. He wiped his tears, resolving to make the commander understand how he felt. Shen Yu went back to the commander's study. He tried to explain that the dice were not a childish gauge, and that it took him sleepless nights just to engrave Jun Su Ang Xiao's name on the red bean. He went through 152 red beans until he was satisfied. He pleaded Jun Su Ang Xiao for his attention and desperately sought Jun Su Ang Xiao's approval. Jun Su Ang Xiao was annoyed at Shen Yu's pleading and slapped the dice from Shen Yu's hands. The dice clattered on the floor and its strap broke. Shen Yu kneeled down to pick it up. He can still fix it, but Jun Su An Xiao stepped on the dice, damaging it irreparably. Shen Yu cried in despair as he collected the remains of the dice. Jun Su An Xiao casually walked out of the study, ordering Shen Yu to not do such a thing again. A sob caused Jun Su An Xiao to turn around. It's not the first time that the commander saw Shen Yu cry, but he never heard him sob or whimper. The commander will better understand the broken heart of someone whose obsession finally came to an end. For the first time, the mute who has always been afraid to make a sound, cried his heart out. Shen Yu sat on his bed, depressed. Song Xing continued to attend to him as he threw pitying glances at Shen Yu. He notes that Shen Yu has looked down ever since he brought him back from their last visit to the commander. He wonders what happened between Shen Yu and the commander. Song Xing told Shen Yu that he would apply medicine to Shen Yu's wounds. He lifted up Shen Yu's hand, which exhibited cuts from his recent fall. He carefully asked Shen Yu if he spoke with the Lord. Shen Yu denied it and told Song Qing that he lost the red bean. Song Qing offered to ask someone to buy red beans for Shen Yu. Shen Yu told Song Qing that all those red beans are meaningless to him. It has to be the one he lost. He asked Song Qing where the dice were, to which the guard answered that he put the broken fragments in the dresser for safekeeping. Shen Yu stood up to collect the dice from the dresser. He remembers when his mom gave him the dice. He remembers being told to give the dice to the one he loves, but she failed to tell him what to do if his beloved does not love him back. Shen Yu decided to go back to the commander's Bingson Pavilion to find the red bean again. He sneaked into the commander's study. You must pass this place in order to reach the Bingson Pavilion. He can hear a voice from inside the study. Is Hong Li Yan offering to help the commander relax? As he grounds the corner to avoid them, he can't help but listen when he hears Hong Li Yan mention his name. Hong Li Yan asks why the concubine Yin left dejectedly after seeing the commander and asks him if he is concerned. Jun Su Wang Xiao knew that there was someone outside listening. He tells Hong Li Yan that he does not care for a dumb servant of the Shen family, and Shen, you must consider it an honor to serve him. What a selfish, conceited man. However, Shen Yu decided to seduce the emperor. The commander claimed to spare Shen Yu's life after the betrayal only because of Shen Yu's beauty and already been punished thoroughly. Shen Yu finally understood at that moment that he meant nothing but a slave to the commander of the north. He shook as he tried to contain his feelings. Everything he thought he had with the commander were nothing but delusions. He realized that all he did to receive the commander's forgiveness 
was for the purpose of leaving comfortably as the commander's side concubine. Shan Yu realized that he had given his heart to the wrong person, and he meant nothing to him. He humiliated himself enough by chasing after him. Shen Yu decides that he should leave the commander's mansion, but not before paying him back for the debt he owes. When Shen Yu left, Jun Su An Xiao was sullen. Hong Li Yan tried to lighten the mood by seducing the commander, but his attempts were pushed back. He can't help but wonder what is wrong. To Hong Li Yan's astonishment, the commander ordered him to get out. Hong Li Yan cannot keep up with the commander's mood. Only one word was brought to mind. The commander is unreasonable. In spite of Song Xing's protests, Shen Yu returned and moved out of his comfortable pavilion and relocated to the woodshed behind Xiao Hua Yard. He started to take on manual labor and work even harder than the other servants. He even took care of the dirty work, including taking poop out of the toilets and taking it outside to the fields as fertilizer. Even when the servants objected to him taking on their tasks, Shen Yu refused to listen and continued to work hard. The servants were worried that the commander would punish them for letting the concubine work. They gossiped amongst themselves if the concubine fell out of the commander's favor. Song Qing scolded the servants for gossiping and ordered them to call the cook as the commander wanted to ask him a question. The servants dispersed and hastily brought the cook to the commander. The cook trembled, thinking that he did something to displease their master. Jun Su An Xiao asked how the food was distributed among the servants. The cook answered that the food portion was based on whether the servants reached their quotas, but he made sure to give concubine Yin enough to eat. Jun Su An Xiao watched as Shen Yu continued to water the snow, presumably to melt it. Jun Su An Xiao turned around in annoyance, while Song Qing dismissed the, the cook. The gossiping maids noted that the Lord had visited them three times to see how concubine Yin is faring. They concluded that the Lord must be punishing the concubine. He must care enough to worry about him, but not enough to put down his pride. Another maid concluded that the commander will someday retrieve the concubine Yin, while another servant is relieved that they don't need to worry about being blamed. Shen Yu listened but cared little for their opinion. He took out a notebook from his robes and jotted down something on it. Shen Yu thinks that he is almost done. Once he completes all the tasks in his ledger, he can finally, finally, what? I'm assuming he plans to leave like he said before. Shen Yu is not there whenever the commander visits the woodshed. The servants dare not assume when the concubine will go back to his comfortable life. They no longer address him as concubine Yin. Instead, they call him the silent concubine. Shen Yu is obsessed with his notebook when a creak is heard. Hong Li Yan cheerfully greeted him as he had been looking all over for him. The servant follows Hong Li Yan, carrying a basket of dirty laundry. He was sent here by the princess consort, who heard that Shen Yu had been doing manual labor for the mansion. She ordered Hong Li Yan to bring Shen Yu the dirty clothes to wash. Shen Yu approaches the dirty laundry, while Hong Li Yan tells Shen Yu that the princess consort ordered the cook to not feed Shen Yu with delicate food. From now on, Shen Yu will only eat leftovers from the other servants. Shen Yu paid him no mind as he sorted through the dirty clothes. Hong Li Yan tells Shen Yu that the princess consort has been very happy with the turn of events and has been pestering the lord again to see her. Hong Li Yan grabbed a hold of Shen Yu's hand, noticing that Shen Yu's wound had not yet healed. The hands were bruised and inflamed. Shen Yu did not appreciate Hong Li Yan's concern and told him that he would wash the clothes with care. Hong Li Yan was annoyed by Shen Yu's stubbornness and told him that he was only worried that the clothes would be dirtied by Shen Yu's bloody hands. Shen Yu ignored him and busied himself with writing down notes in his notebook. Curious, Hong Li Yan asks what Shen Yu is doing. The notebook is comprised of tally marks. Before Hong Li Yan could ask what those tallies are for, Song Qing entered the woodshed, asking Hong Li Yan what he came here for. Hong Li Yan replied that he just came here on the princess consort's orders and to relieve his boredom. He teased Song Qing further by asking if he was worried that he came here to bully Shen Yu. Hong Li Yan reached from his sleeves and brought out a little jar of medicine. He handed the jar to Shen Yu. Shen Yu noticed that the jar smelled of Jin Chuang powder. He tells Shen Yu that he must take care of his hands. He flirted casually with Song Qing to make him blush and touch Shen Yu's hands as he bid him farewell. Red in the face, Song Qing is embarrassed by his antics, shouting at him to not touch Shen Yu. He told Hong Li Yan to leave after doing his master's bidding and not to bother Shen Yu again. Hong Li Yan blew him a kiss in retaliation and told Song Qing that the princess consort is simply her employer, but is not his master. He casually rudely addressed Song Qing by his family name, which annoyed Song Qing further. Shen Yu understood that Hong Li Yan was worried about him. He looked at the two as he thought to himself that they should not worry as he would be leaving soon. 
The commander was sitting in his study when he heard an attendant mention Shen Yu's title. The attendant was trying to stop concubine Yin from entering his study, but Creek was heard, alerting him to Shen Yu's presence. Way to go, Shen Yu. Don't let anyone stop you. Jun Su Anxiao chastised Shen Yu for showing up after a month, sporting a new attitude. Shen Yu was quiet for a while, carrying a bundle with him. Jun Su Anxiao was about to order someone to take Shen Yu out, but Shen Yu knelt in front of him to tell him that he had come to say goodbye. Jun Su Anxiao watched him sullenly. He quietly observed Shen Yu, who was acting indifferent towards him. Gone are the yearning eyes that light up whenever Jun Su Anxiao spares him a glance. This made Jun Su Anxiao uncomfortable. He felt that this was not the same Shen Yu, and he felt the distance between them. Yeah, he does not love you anymore. So let him go. He mocked Shen Yu for brazenly bidding his farewell. He does not think that Shen Yu understands what he is telling him. Shen Yu rummaged through his bundle and presented Jun Su Anxiao with the notebook. The commander took the notebook and sensed that Shen Yu wanted to ask him something. Shen Yu knows that it is pointless to ask as the commander does not care about love, but he wants to know. He breathed in, preparing himself for the question. He asked if Jun Su Anxiao ever liked him. Jun Su Anxiao promptly answered that he indeed liked Shen Yu otherwise. He wouldn't make him a side concubine. This encouraged Shen Yu to ask his second question. He asked if Jun Su Anxiao ever loved him. Jun Su Anxiao found the question ridiculous and promptly answered that he never loved Shen Yu. Shen Yu clenched his hands at the answer, but this only made him realize that his decision to leave is correct. There is no love to hold him back. Shen Yu thanked the commander for making sure that all his needs are met while he was his concubine. Shen Yu acknowledged that he stayed in the mansion for half a year as a freeloader, and Jun Su Anxiao paid a lot of money for medical expenses. Even if Shen Yu gives him all of his wages as a servant, it won't be enough. Shen Yu shamelessly asked the commander to give him some money so that he can start fresh outside the mansion. Jun Su Anxiao belittled Shen Yu's work as a servant and called him incompetent. Shen Yu acknowledged that he is incompetent, but he has been working hard for the past month and made up for all the tasks he was unable to complete when he first started. Shen Yu pointed at the notebook and urged Jun Su Anxiao to open it. Jun Su Anxiao flipped through the pages. It is a tally of all the work Shen Yu completed as a servant. The commander acknowledged that Shen Yu was able to complete half a year's worth of labor in just over a month. Jun Su Anxiao asked Shen Yu what he meant by this. Shen Yu thumped his hand on the floor to emphasize his point. He wants to leave. Not wanting to lose this argument, Jun Su Anxiao asked Shen Yu if he calculated correctly how much he should be paid. He ripped the notebook to pieces. Shen Yu calmly provided the computation he based the salary. Shen Yu showing the commander that their relationship is now transactional. The wages of a servant is 0.2 tail of silver per month, therefore, the commander owes him 1.2 tails in total for the six months worth of labor. He consulted Hong Li Yan for the wage of the cheapest whore, which only cost 0.01 tails of silver for a night. He did not keep track of his home many times the commander slept with him, but asked the commander to do the math for him. The commander chuckled the hint of anger at Shen Yu's price of 0.01 tails. He then told him that he had no small change and threw a piece of silver at Shen Yu. He angrily asked if the silver was enough. Shen Yu picked up the silver and coldly told the commander that he would give him the change after he converted the silver into small coins. The commander watched Shen Yu as he brazenly knelt in front of him. Shen Yu used to quiver in fear at the slightest hint of anger from the commander. But this time, he seems to have no fear at all. His calm demeanor bothers Jun Su Anxiao. For the first time, he is not in control, and he does not like it. Jun Su Anxiao decided that he should not mind Shen Yu's departure as he also wanted him to leave. He clenched his fist as he mocked Shen Yu that he did not need to return the change. Shen Yu will earn more money by working as a whore at Qin Huai Tower. He further insulted Shen Yu by saying that he was satisfied with Shen Yu's work and should be rewarded. He'd feel bad if he did not tip him. Shen Yu was stunned and offended, but he shook it off. He told the commander that he was glad that the commander enjoyed himself. The commander does not want to hear more from Shen Yu and orders him to get out. As he turned his back on Shen Yu, presumably, for the last time, Shen Yu turned to his retreating back and kowtowed three times. The first bow is for the things the commander gave. Food, shelter, medical care, lessons, and learning about the art of war. The second bow is for giving him a name, giving him a dream that he will never forget. The third is for breaking his heart, which brought him back to earth. Now that he has tied up the loose ends, they are now quits. This is a sad separation between Shen Yu and the commander, 
but it has to happen so that Shen Yu can finally stand on his own. I'm sure that Shen Yu can find someone else who will cherish him. So, thank you. Next. Shen Yu screamed in his head that they were quits. He can finally leave. Shen Yu hugged his bundle of belongings and left. At the gate of the mansion, Shen Yu said his goodbyes to Song Qing and Hong Lian. Song Qing fretted over him like a mother hen, worried that Shen Yu might get lost. He even offered to take Shen Yu on horseback. Hong Lian told Song Qing that he should not bother as Shen Yu is no longer Song Qing's charge. If the Lord learns that Song Qing escorted Shen Yu without his permission, he would suspect that they eloped and killed Song Qing in retaliation. That's actually very insightful, Hong Lian. He may work for the princess concert, but he has not done anything more than annoy Shen Yu. Song Qing apologized for his thoughtlessness. Shen Yu thanked Song Qing for taking good care of him all this time. He also thanked Hong Lian for the Jin Chu on powder. Embarrassed that his good deed was acknowledged, Hong Lian told Shen Yu to hurry up and leave. Otherwise, he may think that Shen Yu changed his mind. He offered Shen Yu to come to Qin Hui Tower if he was unable to find work elsewhere. Song Qing promptly told Shen Yu to ignore Hong Lian's offer and to come to him should he need help. He then asked Shen Yu to wait while he got him a carriage. Shen Yu thanked Song Qing for his care, but he had already planned out how he wanted to live his life. He plans to leave the North City with his mother and return to their old hometown in Yunmon. Shen Yu can't believe it. Like a rug pulled under him, all his plans for the future became meaningless by what he heard. Someone took his mother. The servant at Shen Mansion told Shen Yu that some powerful individuals took Shen Yu's mom two months ago. The magistrate Shen allowed it to happen and respectfully bid them farewell. They thought that it was Shen Yu who ordered it so that his mother could enjoy a happy life with Shen Yu. Shen Yu's face paled. There can only be one person who would do such a thing. It could only be the commander of the North, that selfish ML. I knew that his pride would not let Shen Yu go easily. But to use Shen Yu's mom for blackmail, he's just despicable. Shen Yu asked himself why would the commander go to such lengths. A month or two ago, he fell out of the commander's favor. A servant stood in front of the gate, impatiently asking Shen Yu if he was coming in or not. Shen Yu paid him no mind, his mind worked double time to figure out what was going on. If it was the commander who took her, she might be. Shen Yu can't finish the thought. He can't imagine how gruesome his mother's faith may have been. He assures himself that his mother will be all right. He thinks that the Lord let him go easily because he knew that Shen Yu would come back for his mother. Shen Yu realized that his plan was foolish. The North City is within the commander's control. If Jun Su Xiao has his mother, Shen Yu cannot leave him. This is a warning from Jun Su Xiao, telling Shen Yu that only the commander can decide what happens to him. As long as he has power, he will not let Shen Yu go. This is just power tripping. This ML is making me really angry. Shen Yu knocked on the gates of the commander's mansion. Shen Yu was surprised that no one was at the door to answer him. He wonders if the Lord anticipated his return and told the servants to ignore Shen Yu. He realizes that the commander will not make it easy for Shen Yu and plans to make it even more difficult for Shen Yu to see his mother. The commander wants to make his point across, but Shen Yu can't give up. For his mother's sake, he shall endure. As he did so many times before, he knelt at the gate, waiting for the commander to see him. Song Qing approached the commander and told him that the concubine Yin was kneeling outside, requesting to see the commander. Jun Su An Xiao held on to his pride and refused. Shen Yu made him pay for his services. He stood by his decision, as it was Shen Yu who wanted to leave. He even thought that they were quits. He allows Shen Yu to go, but it has only been for a short time, and Shen Yu demands to come back. His house is not a hotel where Shen Yu can come and go as he pleases. Song Qing told the commander that when asked, Shen Yu informed him that the commander had taken his mother away. Song Qing told the commander that it may be a rude thing to say, but what the commander did was despicable. Yeah, you tell him, Song Qing. Song Qing tells him that he has always admired the commander for his intellect, his bravery, and his talents. He even cited a time when Jun Suang Shao led the army and killed 50,000 Huns in just one night. He conveyed his disappointment for the underhanded tactics that the commander is using against a mute like Shen Yu. Jun Su Ang Xiao thought hard. Something is at play here. If he wanted to imprison Shen Yu, he did not need to kidnap his mother. He realized that Shen Yu quickly accused him, thinking that he was such a despicable and treacherous person. He did not deny it and even challenged Song Qing. He tells Song Qing that he need not use Shen Yu's mother to provoke him. So did he or did he not take Shen Yu's mom? The commander does not care what people think of him. He is known to be a murderous, unforgivable man. Why would he care about the opinion of a mute? Coldly, 
he dismissed Song Ching. From his shadows, a soldier approached Jun Su Anxiao waiting for his master's orders. Jun Su Anxiao ordered the soldier to find where Shen Yu's mom was and who was behind her disappearance. Meanwhile, Shen Yu continued to kneel in front of the mansion. He asked himself why won't Jun Su Anxiao let him go, and even goes so far as to kidnap his only family. When is it going to end? From a distance, someone called for his title. It is a servant, waving him to follow. That servant looks suspicious. A servant told Shen Yu that his mother is nearby and he was sent here by the Lord to fetch Shen Yu. On the servant's waist, a wooden pass dangles from his belt. The pass is marked with the emperor's name. Yeah. Shen Yu looked at the servant distrustfully. He has never seen his face in the mansion before. And it is unusual for an unfamiliar servant to approach him at this time. A servant realized that Shen Yu was apprehensive to come with and pulled an object from the lapels of his robes. With this item, Shen Yu is bound to believe him. It is the Three Dragon Jade Pendant. A servant told Shen Yu that the commander refused to see him because the Lord was aware that Shen Yu lost the pendant. Shen Yu thought too if the commander was upset because Shen Yu did not tell him that the pendant was missing and that the Lord was hiding Shen Yu's mother as a threat to Shen Yu not to disobey him again. He wonders if the Lord plans to manipulate and punish Shen Yu by taking his mother away. As Shen Yu reached for the Jade Pendant, the servant quickly took it back out of Shen Yu's reach. The servant told him to follow. It is clear that Shen Yu can't have the pendant back unless he follows the man. Shen Yu got up from his kneeling position, begging silently for the man to return the jade pendant to him. When they rounded a dark corner, the wind was knocked out of Shen Yu's lungs when he was hit harshly by a surprise attack. This caused Shen Yu to fall on cold ground and lose consciousness. It feels cold, something cold splashes on Shen Yu's face. He hears someone harshly telling him to wake up. Still groggy from the attack, Shen Yu blearily opened his eyes and wondered where he was. He observed his surroundings and was greeted by the princess concert planked by a group of rough men. Dai Ro loomed over Shen Yu and told him that she used the jade pendant to lure him here and that no one would come to his rescue. She told Shen Yu that they are at the Qin Huai Pavilion and that it was built to discipline disobedient slaves. No one will know if Shen Yu dies here. Because of Shen Yu's beauty, she lost the affection of both the commander and her brother. She despised Shen Yu's beauty and wanted him to suffer. The cruel princess ordered the group of men to harass Shen Yu. Another voice challenged the princess consort's authority at Qin Huai Pavilion. Dai Ro got upset that someone dared challenge her authority and turned around, only to be slapped by Hong Li Yan. Hong Li Yan greeted Shen Yu sweetly, while the princess angrily asked Hong Li Yan if he was going against her. She wanted Hong Li Yan to remember who introduced him to the Lord and who his employer is. Hong Li Yan untied Shen Yu and helped him up as he mocked the princess's authority and told the princess that she was only an employer. Aside from seducing the commander, he is not obliged to follow all her orders. He proceeded to order his men to throw the princess out and never let her set foot in Kinhuo Tower. Aggrieved at being treated harshly, the princess threatened to destroy Hong Li Yan and Qin Huai Tower as she was being dragged away. Shen Yu thanked Hong Li Yan for saving him and asked him how he knew that he was brought here. Hong Li Yan does not understand sign language and tells Shen Yu that he should be relieved that the princess took him to Qin Huai Tower. Otherwise, Shen Yu would have faced a tragic experience. Hong Li Yan offered to check Shen Yu's wounds and to let him stay in Qin Huai Tower. He told Shen Yu to not go out as Shen Yu is so beautiful that someone may have a crush on him. He even playfully told Shen Yu to not fall in love with him. He is simply taking Shen Yu in like a pet, as Shen Yu has no other place to go. Meanwhile, the thugs that the princess hired carried the princess outside as she struggled. She kept on threatening them that she would come back and have their heads cut off. One of the men told the other that he was previously excited at the thought of harassing the beautiful mute and needed to let out his lust. The others agreed that their master, Hong Li Yan, did not order them to not do anything to the princess. The princess's face contorted in fear as she heard the men talk lewdly about her. A third agreed as it is not every day that one can sleep with a princess. Dairo protested and tried to spew out a string of threats and curses, but her mouth was covered, her faith was sealed, and she was never heard from again. It is raining hard, while the commander stares out the window. He called for the guard, who promptly listened to his order. He ordered the guard to bring Shen Yu to the commander's mansion so that he could take shelter from the rain. Shen Yu can leave after the rain stops. The guard praised the Lord for being kind but told him that he already checked the gate and Shen Yu is no longer at the door. The commander ordered the guard to leave. He wonders why Shen Yu would leave when he is so sure that the commander has his mother. 
He knew that Shen Yu was persistent and would not leave without seeing him. The commander receives a letter in secret, but he cannot focus on it no matter how important it is. Learning that Shen Yu is not at the door unsettles him. He realizes that things are getting out of hand. As he gets up from his desk, he cannot understand how someone like Shen Yu can affect him like this. At Chen Hu Ai Tower, people gather to have the most debauched experience. Shen Yu stayed for a few days at Chen Hu Ai Tower, which is not enough time to rest in Hong Li Yan's opinion. He begged Shen Yu to not leave and to spend more time with him. Shen Yu thanked Hong Li Yan for his kindness and told him that he needed to go look for his mother. Hong Li Yan told Shen Yu that even his subordinates did not find a clue about his mother's whereabouts and was sure that Shen Yu could only do so little. Their solemn parting was interrupted by panic screams. What's Han Li Yan's subordinates shouted for him to run at the cost of his life. Chin Huai Tower is being attacked by masked men. One by one, Han Li Yan's subordinates fee. Han Li Yan does not remember offending anyone to warrant such an attack. He grabbed Shen Yu by the arm and dragged him to his secret tunnel so they could escape. Shen Yu heard the sound of wood snapping and was rooted to the spot as he saw a man thrown from the second floor and wooden beams fallen on them. His first thought is to save Han Li Yan and quickly pushes him out of harm's way. The beams fell on Shen Yu's frail form, while Hong Li Yan struggled to get out of a masked man's grasp. Hong Li Yan wants to check if Shen Yu is alive, but he cannot escape the masked man. One of the masked man told his comrade to check is Shen Yu awake. Why would the masked man care if Shen Yu is alive? As Shen Yu's consciousness wanes, he regrets not finding his mother thinking that he is about to die. Someone calls his name. Shen Yu wonders who is calling him. If he were dead, he wonders why it is warm. Shen Yu is at the Imperial Palace, being tended to by the maids while a figure clad in golden robes watches over him. It is Emperor Ya. He wonders why Yu still has not woken up after three days of being unconscious. The Emperor noticed that Shen Yu was about to wake up and took the washcloth from a maid's hand to make it appear that he had been personally looking after Shen Yu. He asks if Shen Yu is awake, and is happy when Shen Yu finally opens his eyes. Shen Yu's head hurt as he became more aware of his surroundings, his majesty, Emperor Ya looks back at him with a happy expression on his face. Shen Yu wondered how he got here. In a caring voice, the Emperor told Shen Yu to lie back down. He told Shen Yu that he had been unconscious for three days and told him to not rush his recovery. He told Shen Yu that he no longer needed to fear for his life. He tells Shen Yu that his subordinates saved Shen Yu and took him to the capital. He assures Shen Yu that he is safe with him. In his groggy state, Shen Yu thinks of Han Li Yan and his mother well-being before drifting back to sleep. The Emperor observed that Shen Yu is indeed sleeping. He threw the washcloth to the servants. The attendant told him that his presence is needed at the Imperial study as officials have been waiting for him. The attendant also presented a stash of books to the Empire. The Emperor instructed him where he should place the books so the Emperor could read through them to stave the boredom. He also instructed the servants to alert him once Shen Yu wakes. The maids gossip amongst themselves that the emperor pays Shen Yu so much attention that they wonder if the emperor wanted to include him to his harem. Another maid protested that it is impossible as a male concubine is unheard of. The emperor left the room he's keeping Shen Yu in. He praised the Black Feather Army internally for successfully retrieving the man from Yunmeng. He notes that Shen Yu is the key to finding the secret treasure. He thought of his old friend Su An Xiao, who he now regards with such loathing. You will not let Su Anxiao take the things he wanted. At the military camp in the north, an official came to announce that Jun Su Anxiao's commander seal has been taken away. In exchange, he shall receive two pearls, and will be a man whose power is only second to the emperor. Jun Su Anxiao now has a total of nine pearls. With such prestigious accolades, his descendants will be considered distinguished member of nobility. Jun Su Anxiao respectfully accepted the emperor's missive, is amused as he did not expect that Xiao Xia will be quick to carry out his plans. Although the commander did not find Shen Yu, he was able to catch the servant who abducted Shen Yu and interrogated him for two days until the servant cracked under the pressure. The commander quickly learned where Shen Yu, however, he was too late. He rescued Hong Li Yan from the masked men, and in the midst of the rubble that is Qin Hu Ai Tower, he learned that Shen Yu was captured. He then found the princess consort dead in an alley. I feel really sorry for her but she did try to inflict the same faith on someone else. Jun Su Hangxiao knows that Emperor is simply trying to make him lose his military power. The official told Jun Su Hangxiao that he is responsible in completing the transfer of the commander's military transfer. The commander pretended to calmly accept the missive. In an instant, he drew his sword and struck down the official. 
Now that his commander Si was taken, he no longer needs to wait. Song Xing watched as the official struggle for his life. The soldiers are angry that their commander is simply being dismissed. They called the emperor ungrateful to even have the gal to take away the commander's seal and capture the concubine Yin. Jun Su Anxiao faced his troops and told his army that their current government is corrupt. Powerful officials has captured Emperor Ya, making decisions against the emperor's will. He rallied his men to arm themselves and strike the capital down to save the emperor. His loyal troops, who fought under him for many years, readily agreed to follow the commander of the north. Did he just lie to his soldiers? I guess, pretending to be on the emperor's side would endear him more to the soldiers. That's the art of war. With Shen Yu in mind, Jun Su Anxiao will march to the capital to take back what has always been his.